Okay, chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. I think that's where we left off. I read it, and then we, we did a little bit. I started to talk about it. But uh, let me read it again. I'll pick back up where I was and uh, repeat a little bit, and then we'll carry on. You know how that works. John here, in this section, it's further discussion on loving one another, which is obviously one of his main themes that he's playing off of this fact that the false teachers who have gone out do not love the faithful, do not love the orthodox, do not love his community, and he's using that to help these folks see that they are beyond the pale, that they are not part of the church, that they are somebody you need to uh, not to listen to. He says in 1 John 4, 7 to 12, Beloved, let us love one another because love is of God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God loved us this way, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and the love of Him is perfected in us. In verses 7 and 8, he stresses the importance of loving one another, as he's done in a number of places, and he urges them to love one another on the basis that love is of or from God, and they are of or from God, as he said in the preceding verse. So, love, the, love one another, love is of God, and you are of God. So naturally, you should love, you are of God, born of God, God loves, so you should reflect that. It's natural and fitting for those who are born of God, as you are, to reflect the qualities he radiates as a child reflects the qualities of his or her father. So since he is love, you are born of him, you need to be loved. You need to be loving and being, uh, being engaged in that. Indeed, that, that nexus is so powerful. The nexus between the Father being love and your need to radiate or reflect that very same love, it's so powerful that the presence or absence of love, it provides a basis for distinguishing the children of God from those who do not know God. It's that strong and that tight. Those who love have been born of God and they know God, and those who do not love have not known God. That's what he says. And he says the same thing essentially in chapter 3, verses 11 through 20. And again, I, I, I say repeatedly his seemingly absolute statement where he says, everyone who loves cannot be ripped from its context to mean that the loving non-Christian is in fellowship with God. The necessity of faith in Christ it's made known elsewhere in the letter, and it's, of course, it's, it's part of the context of the writing. John is contrasting two groups of purported believers. His readers, his audience, the orthodox faithful community whose claim of faith is accompanied by love for the faithful. He's contrasting them with the secessionists, the heretics, the false teachers whose claim of faith is not accompanied by love for the faithful. So he's using this as a kind of acid test for you to recognize that they are not of the truth and not part of the faithful. And remember that love includes that, that set of duties to one's fellow man that we look about. It's not simply talk. It's not simply a feeling. It's not simply uh, that. It, it involves these duties to one's fellow man that one who claims a relationship with God must take seriously. In other words, you cannot simply be talking. Love has skin on it. And he talked about that. Then in verses 9 and 10, you get here a definition of love. He says, In this the love of God was manifested among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God manifested or revealed the nature of his love, not simply the fact of his love. He manifested, he revealed the nature of his love by sending his only son in the, into the world 
in order that we might live through him. See, this is where love finds its true definition, and it's what our culture ignores completely. Our culture trivializes the concept of love into simply some kind of emotional pull or something and completely misses the depth of love. And he's pointing this out here, you see. God manifests the nature of his love. Well, how did he express the nature of his love and reveal the nature of love? Well, he did it by this sacrificial commitment to our welfare of sending his son to die as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Well, you talk about love with skin on it. That's costly. That's really doing something. So God has manifested that John's focus is on the revelation of the nature of his love, as I say, and not simply the fact of his love. As he said in, in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 16, And this we have known love, that that one laid down his life on our behalf. It is in this that we understand what love is. Love involves this kind of commitment. And as I say many times, you recognize this perhaps more readily than in a marriage relationship, although you should recognize it there, where husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church, you can't get more sacrificial than that. But we tend to recognize it more in a parent-child relationship, where parents endure and struggle and do everything and just pour themselves out. Why? They want to bless their children. They want to give and give and sacrifice and work. Why are they doing that? They're doing it because they love their kids. You see, and that's, so that's this idea, that's this nature. Now, the older translations rendered, there's a Greek term in here, monogenes, in chapter 4, verse 9. And the older Greek translations rendered that word as only begotten. But it's correctly translated in the newer trans, translations, the newer versions, as either one or one and only. As Gary Burge, this is really just a footnote, but Gary Burge says in his commentary, the suggestion only begotten understands the latter half of the word. See, it's mono only genes. And so where does this genes come from? He says, understands the latter half of the word is derived from the Greek verb genao, to give birth. So that's where people thought it was only begotten, only born, you see. But he says that's incorrect. Rather, the word would derive from genos type or kind. So only kind, unique. So that's why you see that reflected. And I undoubtedly spent too much time on this. But let me just read this to you quickly and then we'll move on. But this is a note from the New English translation. New English translation has a lot of neat interpretive notes in there. And he says, although the word translated one and only is often rendered only begotten, such a translation is misleading since in English it appears to express a metaphysical relationship. The word in Greek was used, only, was used of an only child or a daughter. It was also used of something unique only one of its kind, such as the mythological bird called the phoenix. From here it passes easily to a description of Isaac, Hebrews 11, 17, uh, there and also in Josephus, who was not Abraham's only son, but was one of a kind because he was the child of promise. Thus the word means one of a kind and is reserved for Jesus alone in the Johannine literature of the New Testament. While all Christians are children of God, Jesus is God's son in a unique one of a kind sense. The word is used in this way in all of its uses in the Gospel of John. So that's just kind of a footnote. If you're wondering, you know, you see only begotten, you see one and only, only. That's what lies behind that. But now, uh, back to 11 and 12. Here you get the exhortation to love one another. You had it before, but you see this is one of the, the main themes that he's striking. And that was, those themes come up. Obedience, Christology, and this idea of loving, all of these come up because the context of the writing makes them important. That's why he's beating these themes. And so he says in 11 and 12, he says, Beloved, if God loved us this way, if he loved us this way, not just generically loved us, if he loved us this way, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and the love of him is perfected in us. See, since God loved us in this way, well, in what way? In the way where he sacrificed for us, gave for us, suffered for us. If God loved us in this way, we also, in the same way, 
See, we also must love the brothers and sisters. If we are of God, how can we treat them differently than he has treated them? If God has loved us this way, sacrificially, and we are born of God and we are of God, how can we not likewise love the brothers and sisters sacrificially? That's what he's driving at. Though God is invisible, believers who love one another, they reveal that God is living in them. No one has ever seen God, but they see him in you when you are transformed and are living like God. They see his image there. You see, they see this reflection there. And so he says that, that he's invisible, but believers who love one another, they reveal this truth that God is living in them. That love is, is fruit of God's abiding, and we recognize that. This is God's spirit in us. This is who is transforming us. He is in us, making us into the image of his son. Now, you and I resist this. In this fallen world, though we are born of God, we continue to imperfectly allow the spirit to transform us. But it is his transforming work. So anything in your life, that is good and noble and right and holy and all of those things, that is because God is transforming you. To Him be the glory. All you are doing is getting out of the way and allowing Him to change you. And so he says here that in this, in this loving, you see, this love is fruit of God's abiding. Therefore, the fact of this love, the fact that this love was a reality in their lives. You remember in chapter 2, verse 8, he told them, that they did indeed love this way, well, that should reassure them that they really do know God despite what, may be, what the secessionists, the heretics, may be telling them. You see this idea of assurance. He keeps telling them that. He keeps letting them know. And so he had told them before, you really do love God. God is revealing himself in you through your love for one another, and that's a fact in your lives. And so you should take great peace and assurance from that fact and not be rattled by whatever these secessionists are telling you that you should worry about your salvation because you're not on board with them. So you take peace. And so he's reassuring them of that. And he says that if they love one another, God abides in, God abides in them and the love of him, the love of him is perfected or completed in them. Well, it's in chapter 2, I don't know if you remember, but in chapter 2, verse 5, we have the same question. There's an ambiguity here in the phrase. It's just inherent in the, in the genitive here where you have love of him. Well, does that mean his love for us? In other words, is it subjective or is it objective? Is it our love for him? You know, like if I said the, love of, if I said the house of Steve, well, you know, I meant Steve's house. Okay, the love of him, is it his love for us? Or is it our love and he, he is the object? Okay, well, the context has to tell you, and sometimes the context is ambiguous. And this is one of those cases, but in this instance, I favor the subjective sense. So I think what he's saying, he's referring to his love for us is perfected or completed in us. You say, now what does that mean? I think what he's after is that God's love for us reaches its intended effect when it reverberates horizontally in the body of Christ. God loves us, and that love comes to completion when it is manifested horizontally in our love for each other. That's the full extent of God's love. That's his purpose. I think Georg Strecker is on the right track. He's a German commentator. He says, the love of the brothers and sisters that is now and is to be practiced in the future by the Christian community is the love demanded by God, the love that is in accordance with God's nature. The author wishes to say that in the love of the sisters and brothers achieved by human beings, God's agape reaches its goal. It is not because human love is superior to divine love, but because the love of God for human beings intends by its very nature to actualize itself in the Christian community in the form of mutual love of human beings for one another. In other words, I think that's God's 
goal with regard to our loving is he, he, I mean, he loves us and his intent and purpose and the fulfillment of that is that that love then spreads horizontally. And so I think that's what he's after. Now, if you say, well, I don't think that, I think he's more using it objectively so that's our love for him. Well, if, they, if it means that, if it means our love for God, well, then he's saying essentially the same thing he said in chapter 2, verses 5. An obedient love for God is a mature or perfect or complete love for him, and a key part of that obedience is loving one another. So it would make sense either way. You can, you can understand it either way, but I favor here. I think it's more likely the other. And this next section, chapter 4, verse, I'm trying to move because uh, I got people saying, well, archaeology in the Bible, are we ever going to get to that? Someday. But in, in four sections, in, in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, here I'm going to bust this up. Instead of reading it and then giving you the little sections, I'm going to do it in smaller sections. But there you have this reassurance from having the Spirit. You have reassurance from confessing the truth. And you have reassurance from loving so in the first section, in 4.13 through 16a, the first part, he says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and have believed the love which God has in us. He says in verse, in verse 13, now if by this, when he says by this, we know that we abide in him and he in us. Now if that by this, if that has a backward reference, in other words, he, by this he means what he's just said. Well, if it has a backward reference, then he's saying that the reason they're loving one another lets them know they abide in God and God abides in them is because it confirms that he has given them his spirit. Or it says he has given them of his spirit, which would mean he has given them a share of the spirit who fills the whole church. So if it's his backward reference, that's what it's talking about. He's saying the reason they're loving one another lets them know that they abide in God and he in them is because it confirms that God has given them his spirit. See, this love that they are manifesting and reflecting is fruit of the spirit. It is the spirit in them who is doing this. Now, if by this has a forward reference, if it has a forward reference, then he's saying that they know they abide in God and God in them because he's given them his spirit. You see, he's not looking back to the love as evidence of that. He's just saying because he's given them his spirit. But even in that case, as I've explained, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, even in that case, I think their knowledge of the spirit's presence is based at least in part on the spirit's fruit in their lives. In other words, I don't think he means purely subjective uh, experience of the spirit where I know it somehow only internally. I think this idea of my experience and understanding of the Spirit within me is borne out in part by what the Spirit produces in my life, an orthodox confession, obedience, and particularly loving one another, all of which is absent from the false teachers. So if that's the case, it winds up there. The false teachers claim to have the Spirit. It's shown to be false. You see, by their lack of love for the brothers and sisters and their rejection of the truth about Jesus Christ. They don't, they deny the orthodox confession. And so their, their claim there. Then in 14, verses 14 to 16, the first part, there he says, <clears throat> John and others were eyewitnesses. He says that they, and, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. So John and others, they were eyewitnesses to Jesus' life, and they testify about that coming and its purpose. And so we open the book with that idea. You see that we, we have seen, we're telling you the truth about this. We, we're eyewitnesses of his life, and we testify about its coming and its purpose, that God the Father sent the Son as the Savior of the world. We, we know this, we saw it, we were there, and we're telling you. This is the dirty lowdown. This is the truth. 
that the Father sent the, sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Now, in those few words, you see, there are a lot of things, implications in those few words. In those few words, we see the Father's love in sending the Son. Right? He says the Father sent the Son as the Savior of the world. So implicit in that is the Father's love for us, which love we are called to reflect. We see that Jesus was sent from heaven. Who's sending him? Well, the Father. So what's implicit in that? That Jesus, in fact, is sent from heaven. He is God incarnate. He is the Son of God incarnate. What is that? That's something the, the heretics deny. And we see that he came to save us from our sin, which means what? We must forsake them. He came at such great cost to save us and deliver us from our sin, and yet we have these people out here trying to tell you that how you live doesn't matter. And so all of that is tied up in that little phrase, and in light of this apostolic testimony, John, in verse 15, he brings assurance to his readers he gives them assurance again by stating, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Well, you wonder, you know, you say, well, why, why does John, why does he speak here of confessing that Jesus is the Son of God rather than repeating what he just said about God sending his Son to be the Savior of the world? In other words, in this verse, he says, we've seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior in the world. Whoever confesses, you're expecting him to say, whoever confesses that, that God sent the Son as Savior of the world. But he doesn't say that. He says, whoever confesses, Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, and I think all of these things are simply parts that represent the whole. Let me read to you what Colin Cruz says about it. I think he's on target. He says, it's puzzling why the author does not stay with the content of the testimony as he stated it in the previous verse. The reason probably is that the full orthodox confession to be maintained in the face of the secessionists, the heretics, those who came up from within the church and went out and are now trying to deceive these people to come over to their view, he says the reason probably is that the full orthodox confession to be maintained in the face of the secessionist denials was that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, who came in the flesh as Savior of the world and gave himself as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. <clears throat> However, the author did not need to state this fully every time he alluded to the secessionist teaching. This is part of what I, I keep harping on about the context of the writing. You see, it's easy. If you think this writing just parachutes down without a context, and you can then just take it any way you want, well, you're going to misread it. And that's not just true of John. That's true of the Bible. You see? So, but he says here, the author didn't need to state this fully every time he alluded to the secessionist teaching. He could call his reader's attention to all that the secessionists denied and to all that his readers should affirm by referring to but one aspect of it, as he does in verses 14 and 15. What the author affirms in verse 15 is that those who do acknowledge Jesus in this way are those in whom God lives and who live in God. So it's a way of saying the orthodox. It is the way of saying those who embrace the apostolic confession, the true gospel that you took and you're holding to. They are of God, they abide in God, and God abides in them. The other guys, not so. Not so. But in that, you see how important some of these things are, you see. It's very important. Now, the apostles, the apostles and all who accept their testimony, see, which means the church at large, and John's readers specifically, they have known and believe the love that God has for them. You say, now what is that about? Well, that's inherent in accepting the gospel. That they have known and believe the love that God has for them. The gospel is the ultimate revelation of God's love, right? That's what he's talking about. How does God demonstrate this? How does he reveal to us the nature of his love? Well, he sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So everybody who embraces and accepts the gospel 
Therefore, the, they understand and have known and believe the love that God has for them. It is inherent in the gospel. To accept the gospel is to accept and to believe the love that God has for us. So this is what he says, that everybody who say, they know that. In believing the truth that God sent his son to die for you, and believing that is the truth, and accepting that and confessing that, well, then you know the love that God has for you. You see, you know that you have known that, and you've believed that. Now, given the preposition that John uses here in the, in the last year, where he says, the love which God has in us. You see, that, that preposition, you'd expect for, that God has for us, but this normally means in, and there may be a subtlety here. You know, John may, this may be a subtlety that John is throwing in here, and as Stephen Smalley remarked, he says, John may be referring not only to God's love shown to us in the life and death of Jesus, he's certainly referring to that. But he may be referring not only to that, but also to that experience of God's love in the life of the church and the lives of believer, which is, believers, which is created by the Spirit. See, he may also be referring to this horizontal reflection or manifestation of this love. So we have known it in that in accepting the gospel, we embrace the love that is inherently in that gospel and then also, as transformed, spirit-indwelt people, we manifest that love horizontally so we have that experience of it also. So I think that may be part of what he's talking about there. And then in 416, second part, 416 to 18, he says, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. In this, in this love has been perfected among us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because just as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears has not been perfected in love. You know, sometimes when you read these things, I don't know about you, but when I study, sometimes I read these things and I go, man, you know, John, you know, Lord, help me. <laughs> What is, what is, John, you know, you don't really, you know, put things together. So uh, uh, some of these things take digging, but that's where I find some of the most rewarding study comes from. Now, because God is loving by nature, as shown preeminently in his saving action, God is loving, he's loving by his nature, which is shown to us. That's shown to us in his saving action on behalf of mankind. So John, because God's loving by his nature... John assures his readers that the one who abides in God, that the one who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Okay, so this is God is, is by his nature loving. So those who abide in love, they abide in God and God in him. As Cruz says, they, unlike the secessionists, see, I keep, I keep bringing this up, and I'm not the only one who recognizes this. But he says, they, unlike the secessionists, do not love each other, do love each other. I'm sorry, they, unlike the secessions, do love each other. And the author wants them to recognize that this is evidence that God does live in them and they in God, despite the assertions of the secessionists to the contrary. As I've said, the secessionists, as true of most all heretics, they seek to disrupt your security and your peace in Christ so you will pay more attention to them. Because if they can make that crack, you then now are worried and you have that anxiety that then says, well, help me out and tell me. What do I really need? And so uh, you, you see this, but he's assuring them. He says that in this, you say he, he says that in this, meaning in loving one another, God's love has been perfected in the sense of, verse, of chapter 4, verse 12. You see? In this, verse 17, in this, love has been perfected among us. Well, in the sense that God's love for us reaches its completion or reaches its intended effect when it's expressed horizontally in the body of Christ. That's what he just said. Okay, so, so in this, love is perfected in the sense that he means in verse 12. And the result is that believers who are loving one another as the Orthodox community is, as he said in chapter 2, verse 8. 
the believers who are loving one another, they may have confidence on the day of judgment because already in this world, they are the same as Christ. They're the same as he is because already in this world, they are the same as Christ is in the sense that they too are in mutual union and in dwelling with God. Christ is in mutual union and in dwelling with God. And he says here that if you're loving one another, then you are as Christ is because in loving one another, you too are in mutual union and in dwelling with God. See, so he wants them to recognize that. As Brown says, the author, Raymond Brown, he says the author is repeating the reason he gave for confidence when he spoke about the parousia, the coming. We are God's children right now. So as such, right, as somebody who's as Christ in the sense that I'm in mutual union and in dwelling with God, they have no fear to face in the day of judgment, right? What is to fear in the day of judgment? If I am in mutual union and in dwelling with God, I am in him, he's in me. Well, what's the fear of the, the judgment? And yet you have so many Christians, I say you have so many Christians who sit here and go, and I'm talking about faithful people. Sinful, yes, but faithful. So many people that chew their knuckles and sit here and worry, worry, and you take polls and say, what happens when you die? I don't know, you know, maybe I hope there's a 50% chance I go to heaven. I go, what a book are you reading? You know, what book are you reading? See, this is, not, this is not what he's talking about, you see. Because already in, the war, in this world, they have this mutual union and indwelling with Christ, indwelling with God as Christ has. Now, within this, this stream of God's perfect or complete love, see, within that stream, a love that flows from God to mankind and back to God and to each other, in that stream, See, in that stream of God's perfect or complete love, there all fear of judgment has been cast out. So in this stream where God's love flows to mankind and back from mankind back to God and horizontally to one another, in that stream of love, all fear of judgment is cast out. The reason is that those who abide in this love, as I just said, are in mutual union and in dwelling with God and thus they, they can be confident that there's no condemnation for them. That's verse 17. You see, in this love has been perfected that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. You see, so, so here that th there's no condemnation. Now, the one who fears judgment, he says, has not been perfected in love and that he has not received the intended blessing of God's love. Now, notice here, see, he speaks of the perfected. Here, it refers to the person, not the love. You see, before God's love was perfected, in his love for us as it reverberates horizontally in the body of Christ, it reaches its full purpose, completion, its extension. Well, here he's speaking of the person has not been perfected. The person hasn't been. The one who fears judgment, he hasn't been perfected in that he's not received the intended blessing of God's love God's intent for us is that we be at peace that we not live in fear of judgment because of what he's done for us see when God's love has had its intended effect on us when it is it has perfected us in that sense we eagerly look forward to the Lord's return we look forward to the Lord's return knowing that the judgment will be our entrance into the final state of glory. Will it be because you're so cool? No. It'll be why? It'll be because we are His. So we are His. And He just, you come in. Well, you know, I, that I, you know, do, no, you come in. You're in me, I'm in you. So you come on in. So there is no fear, you see, in that stream of love. And then he says in 419, see, you never thought we'd make chapter 5. We're breaking in. <laughs> We're breaking in. 419 to the first part of uh, chapter 5, verse 2. He says, we love because he first loved us. 
If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen is not able to love God whom he has not seen. And we have this commandment from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the one who fathers, I should have taken that asterisk out, because typically I'll put that in there, not always, but typically I'll put that in there when there's a textual issue. And when I cut and pasted it from something I had done, I didn't take it out. But anyway, uh, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the one who fathers also loves the one fathered of him. In this we know that we love the children of God when we love God. So in verse 19, in verse 19 we get this God's initiating love. We love because he first loved us. The reason John and his readers, the faithful church, the reason they love as they do is that God first loved them. This is the basis. Our love was activated by God's love. The priority, the initiative, the one who began is God. See, loving is his initiative. Then he says in 420, he says, he declares flatly that anybody who claims to love God while hating, meaning not loving, while not loving the, his brother, is lying. You see, that person's claim, is that the second bell? All right. See, I, I'm delirious. See, that, that, person's, that person's claim is contradicted by his life. Right? John, now, John no doubt has the false teachers in mind as he has throughout. So here they are, not doing for, rejecting, not giving the brotherly obligations to the orthodox. So he's had them in mind. Well, that person's claim to love God is contradicted by their refusal to love the brothers and sisters. Though they, they claim love for God, they profess love for God, that claim is shown to be a delusion by the fact they reject any brotherly duty toward the faithful. Oh, I love God. I'm down with God. I love God. Well, then why do you refuse to love the Orthodox, those who are born of God, the faithful community? You're revealing, you're tipping, you're showing your hand. You're not of God. Because if you were of God, you would love the brothers and sisters. Now, the connection between loving God and loving fellow believers, that connection is explained by this statement in the second part of verse 20. And it's a statement arguing from the lesser to the greater. As Cruz puts it, he says, if people cannot carry out the lesser requirement to love their fellow believers whom they have seen, if they can't do that, he says, they cannot carry out the greater requirement to love God whom they have not seen. If you can't do this, well, how can you tell me you can do that? You see, you can't. You see them. And won't love them. And so if you won't do that, well, then you certainly will not and do not love the God you cannot see. 421. In 421, he says, And we have this commandment from him, the one who loves God must also love his brother. As Cruz says here. He says, Here the author picks up a major theme from the Last Supper discourse in the fourth gospel where Jesus stresses that his disciples' love for him must express itself in obedience to his command, and that his command is that they should love one another. The author's purpose in picking up this theme here is to reassure his readers who did love their fellow believers that they really knew God and to show them that the claims of the secessionists to know him were false. Right In, in verses 1 to 2, uh, the first part here, I'm going to try to finish this and see if I can make it. Uh, he concludes this section on this inseparability of loving God and loving one another by stating two truths that together establish this link. And first he says that those who believe the apostolic gospel, see, as opposed to the Christologically warped gospel of the false teachers, those who believe the true apostolic gospel have been born of God. They are children of God. And you see that in chapter 3, verse 1. Then he appeals to a maxim 
that is drawn from human experience. It says, everyone who loves the one who fathers, or the one who begets, also loves the one fathered or begotten of him. See, a person who loves the father also will love the father's child. They go together. See, a child is so precious to a father. And the bond between them is so strong that love for the father cannot be separated from love for his child. You know, that's, the, that's what's behind the sentiment in a statement like, if somebody's got it out for your kid, they've got it out for you. Well, what's behind that? Well, behind that is this link between loving the father, the parent, and loving his child. You can't just separate those because these two are bound together. Like I said, you come after somebody's kid, you know, you're not loving the parent. And so that's the idea. And see, that's a maxim from human experience. He says in the second part of chapter 2 that it is in this. You see, meaning in this maxim that we know we love the brothers and sisters when we love God. You see, give, I heard that bell. Given that everybody who loves the parent loves the parent's children, those who love God necessarily will love his children, fellow Christians. See, that's, that's the argument. That's the idea. He said, you cannot tell me that you love God when you don't love his children. Because you were born of him, you are his children, so to love him is to love his offspring. So, heard that bell, thanks for coming. Uh, one day we'll get to archaeology and the Bible. <laughs>